welcome you to our year-end celebration service here at Stonewater Church. Uh, today, we're gonna be celebrating what God has done through 2019 and then also looking ahead in 2020. You know, this past year, our theme has been breaking barriers. And we've been asking God to break barriers uh, in, the, in, in our lives and break barriers in the life of our church. Anything that prevents us from just walking closely with the Lord, we've been asking God to reveal that to us and then uh, by His power that, that we would push through and break, break through those barriers. Uh, today, in, in our time today, we wanna share some of those stories, uh, some of those celebrations. Uh, we also want to have a, a time of, of worship and music. We're going to hear from, from our band, who uh, a song that they wrote th this, this past year. We're also going to have a, a devotional or a message uh, that will challenge us all in, uh, in 2020. So, um, guys, as I, I'm here with the campus pastors. These are our shepherds at every one of our campuses. And, and I just want to ask you guys, as we think back through 2019, uh, what's been a favorite moment for you? Yeah, it's really hard to choose one in 2019 because it's been such an amazing year. But uh, I always love it when God just blows people away with his healing power. And about a month ago in our Elevate student ministry, our Elevate director, Jeremiah West, had uh, just gotten done teaching about how to pray. And so there was a, a young lady in Elevate who had recently been injured. Her, her back was really hurt and she, she loves dancing and she was so injured that she couldn't dance and could hardly move in that regard. And so uh, the students came up on stage and, and laid hands on her and prayed for her. And right then God miraculously healed her back. And it was uh, a lot of tears and a lot of laughter, um, but that's just one of many examples where we've gotten to witness the incredible power of God. Yeah, that, that's a really cool moment. I, I remember for me, it was uh, just a few weeks back, uh, we did the service where we had communion at the end of service and we, we hosted the tables and uh, just a, a powerful time of worship there at the end. And, and me and my wife, uh, Stacy, we got to host one of the tables and uh, it, it, all the families that, that came to our table were families that, that we'd been walking through the different things with or, or had known what was going on and what God had been doing in their life and their story. And I remember at one point as we're, we're there and we're helping and, and, and we're praying and, and people are, are taking communion, looking over, my wife is just bawling. Like she's just crying and, and I begin to cry uh, because it was just this this perfect moment of, of really humility and submission and uh, just God almost uh, completing the work that he had started uh, the entire year. And so uh, it, for me, uh, it was just one of those powerful moments in watching God do something really cool and, and people we care about and people we love in, in Stonewater family. Yeah, I'm a lot like David and in the sense that we had several and I had a really hard time trying to figure out a moment, but the most recent thing that I can really think of is at Regen. We were there, I was speaking that night, I was sitting in the front row and the worship leader that night, J uh, Jared Stone was singing and he asked the audience to sing along. And it was a song, Raise a Hallelujah. And it's one of those things, there's no words to describe it other than God was there. And to hear those people that were there for Jesus and needed Jesus, I knew He was there. And that's my most recent moment. That had to be a special moment. You know, when I think back to this past year, my favorite moment took place at the One Big Family Service. Remember that, we were at The Promise and it was the moment there at the end where everything just came together. Uh, people were getting baptized, showing just life change that was taking place in their life uh, in the moat while kids were swimming in the moat. Y'all remember that? And uh, so kids are swimming, people are getting baptized, and then fireworks were going off at the exact same time. And I remember just, I was standing on the bridge at that moment, and I remember just thinking, God, you've got to be just pleased, and you've got to be uh, just taking pleasure in this moment. And uh, that was that that was definitely my highlight this past year, but also that might be, that might be my highlight from the entire entire time here, here at Stonewater. You, you know, when we talk about breaking barriers, or when we talk about God being pleased, one of the the places that I know God is pleased is when life change takes place in people's life. At Stonewater, we really believe that uh, that people change and that God causes changes in people's life. We want y'all to hear a story of life change and how God uh, broke some barriers in uh, the life of a member of Stonewater Church.
basically from an early point in my life. Um, abuse was just an everyday part. My earliest memories from three and four were homelessness, going in dumpsters, just being a type of hungry that no one should ever be. And that was just everyday life. That was, that was, that was our life. After, after kindergarten, I went to live with my biological father and the hunger was better and there was a roof and there was no more homelessness. Uh, but the neglect and the, the abuse um, didn't, didn't end when we left the junkyard. In middle school was the breaking point where I finally had enough. Um, I became extremely suicidal, um, tried taking my life on multiple accounts. Um, it was to the point that the internet was kind of a norm then. Um, most people had the internet. Most people were going on AOL. Uh, while my friends were in chat rooms, I was Googling how to commit suicide and trying those out. And I just kept waking up. At 16, I got a call that my dad had killed himself. <laughs> um, at 16, everything I thought that I knew about survival and just making it uh, came crashing down. What would have been my sophomore year of college, I got into a car accident, um, pretty severe car accident. They, uh, they assumed when they drove up on the accident that I was deceased. So that was the second moment where I was just like, man, there is, there is something really out there that I am not paying attention to that is trying to get my attention. I think there may be a God. The year I met Rowdy, my husband, was the year I was diagnosed with lupus. I had been symptomatic throughout college. We didn't plan on getting married, but I wanted a baby. I wanted a baby, and I felt like if I had a baby, it would make me feel whole again. It would give me some form of happiness that I hadn't experienced in all these years. It, all there was was negative to really look back on. Um, and I wanted something positive. I wanted something that was mine. I wanted something that I could, in a way, control. With lupus, that's kind of a hard thing to do. Having a baby is something that uh, isn't usually in the cards for most people with lupus. And it wasn't in our cards for, for a couple years. I decided um, that I think we need to go to church. Like, and not like go like we had been going for the past couple of years, periodically, when it felt like we were convenient for us, when it felt like church was convenient for us. But we needed to really go. We started going um, regularly January of 2019. We, uh, we started bringing our daughter every Sunday. She started going to Kids Men. And it just, felt like we were finally doing something right as opposed to doing what everyone wanted us to do or what we thought was right. It just, I don't know, it just felt like we were in the right place at the right time for the first time. On March 30th of 2019, they were doing baptisms and we were in the congregation, we were listening to the sermon and the entire sermon, I kind of felt like I was going to throw up. I just had this pull. And we, I mean, we had been coming for three months. When they started doing baptisms, they got through a couple baptisms and I just started walking. And Rowdy was like, you going to get Lucy? And I said, no, I said, I'm going to get baptized. And I remember just running as fast as I could to the pool and just seeing Jeremy there and being really thankful that it was Jeremy that was gonna baptize me of all people. And that it just, it was the, finally the first time that I felt like I opened a door that could let everything else in. Things started to finally feel less alone and more like I had a belonging and a family. And I could see every instance of my life back to 
three and sleeping on a dirt floor and being in a dumpster, or seven just being on the ground bleeding, or just all these instances in my life where he had tried to rescue, he had rescued me. I was alive. I literally lived through a life of all the abuses and I lived, but I never recognized him and I never saw him. But he spent an entire lifetime chasing after me while I just ran and ran and ran. And it just amazes me that it took 27 years and there's gotta be more people out there like me. There's gotta be more Amandas that are just lost and don't know how to be found yet. There's gotta be more Amandas that are just the sheep that he's trying to rescue that don't know that he's coming and don't know that he's looking and don't, you know, don't feel his touch because they don't know about him. So hey guys, uh, thank you for just spending a little time with us this evening. Uh, just a great opportunity at the end of the year, uh, just to celebrate kind of the things that God has done in your lives and our lives and in the life of a church. I know many of y'all represent a ton of different ministries, a ton of different events and activities, uh, and just great groups of people within our church where God showed up and did amazing things. And so I just want to take a few minutes uh, today and just kind of celebrate that. And so. I wanted to gather us up and just give a few minutes for each of y'all to share just a little bit about how God showed up in y'all's life over 2019. All right, so we'll go first. So we started off at Wildwoods and we got asked to go to the kids camp. Um, and I had two kids going, so I decided to volunteer with it. And um, we ended up going and the greatest moment ever, both my kids, Jacob and Chloe, both found Christ. And I thought the kids camp was gonna be for them but I think I got more out of the kids camp after day one of realizing the impact that we were having with all of the kids. Yeah, I think definitely working in Wildwoods in children's ministry has given me such like a more like less powerful and more like personal look at God. Like I get to teach in a way that my first graders will understand, but also it helps me understand. So we're fairly new here to Granbury and to Stonewater. So this has been a year of getting connected here at Stonewater for us. And that has ranged from getting involved in ministry, uh, from uh, Journey with Jesus back at the Easter time, uh, to being involved in the group's ministry here now at the church. We're so thankful for that. But one of the other things that we're so thankful for this year is the new friendships and relationships that we've developed through the second half leaders ministry that's been started this year at the church. We were also able to join a community group this year. And so they went through my pregnancy with me because our having a baby, of course, was the big highlight of our year. Um, and to just see our kids grow and love each other um, as Christ would love each other. So I actually, just like you, started going to the community group on Monday night. They've been there for certain things throughout um, this year that I've really struggled with and I can connect to them in a way that I can't really connect to other people. So who else wants to share what God did in their life in 2019? Well, 2019 has been a very adventuresome time for us. Um, at the beginning of the year, we had only been here a year and we relocated to uh, Granbury. And uh, we were having some marital issues and we went to uh, the uh, re-engage program and we kind of a family group or a community group formed out of our re-engage group. We, we went from having some weaknesses to having strength. And God did all that just in time for us to begin a journey that Madeline and I would like to share with you. Um, in July of this year, I went in for just basically mammogram checkup, what we're all supposed to do, and lo and behold, found out, hey, I have breast cancer. And it kind of knocks the you know, wind out of you. And being from a family of having issues like that, 
it was like, okay, just hit it running. So I think the steps leading up to that were, you are going to be stronger as a couple by going through re-engage. And once we got the diagnosis, of course, it is like, hurry up and wait. Our community group and all the re-engage people have been our anchor. They have been so strong for us and been there. So I can tell you now that we are cancer free. And are we done with the journey completely? No, we're not. I will always have to go in and get checked up and make sure things are okay. I love the opportunity for us just to gather and just share some of those stories. I know there's so many more stories just in our church family, in our community of what God did and, uh, and how he continues to use this church and just bless the people of this church. So thank you guys for just your honesty and openness and for willing to share. I can't wait to see what God is going to do in 2020. family. I'm here with Justin Sprayberry, our executive pastor, and Joey White, my brother, and our church planning pastor. And, uh, you know, guys, one of the things that uh, we all want for our church is to be a church of faith. Yeah, it's true. You know, in Hebrews 11:6, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. This next year in 2020, our theme is going to be to go for it. And to go for it looks like that we exercise faith. And, you know, as we think about our church, uh, we're a church that we really want to celebrate faith and celebrate faith in the lives of our people. Um, Joe, what's an area that you've seen people exercise faith at Stonewater? 2019 has been a great year for us to start churches. We've sent two main teams out uh, to start churches this year. One was in Breckenridge, Texas. And we were able to send a lot of mission teams just from here in Granbury and, and our campuses there. And we've also sent uh, six uh, people to Las Vegas. Sin and their, City, baby. <laughs> Sin City uh, to start a church in 2020. It's a great And uh, so excited for them. Yeah. Well, so, so it required faith to go and to do that, to step out, to, to go and, and start churches. Justin, where's, where's an area you've seen? So the, the preschool. We started the preschool yeah. this last year, and that was just that's just been an incredible journey. Uh, so many people stepping out in faith all along the way. I mean, from the staff, it was a brand new preschool, you yeah. know, and so they came on board and said, you know what, we're going to love these kids like crazy. Uh, we're going to do our absolute best. And sure enough, uh, the preschool wins Hood County's best preschool this last <laughs> all right. year. And so it's like, good. yeah, yeah, congratulations to Misty and, and their team. They just... Man, yeah. they just knocked it out of the park. And, and, so, and they're pouring faith into those children they are. every week. Yeah, yeah. And we've seen families come to the church, and it's yeah. just been an incredible win. Yeah, How about so. some more heroes of faith, Joe? Yeah, so really everything mm -hmm. we're talking about is starting something new. Yeah. And yeah. anytime you start something new, it's a step of faith. So for us, we started, Lisa and I started a new ministry called Second Half Leaders. And Second Half Leaders, it's for people living in the second half of their life and all throughout scripture, you see that God really used people in the second half of their life to make a huge impact on the kingdom of God, even more than the first. So we've already had a conference. We're having another conference in March 2020. But really, over the next three years, we're trying to build this ministry to be a huge core ministry in our church that would really prepare people that the second half of their life would be way better for the kingdom of love God it. than the first. Love so what it. I love about the second half leaders is they're really taking steps of faith to start ministries, to get involved in ministries, and to really find purpose in, yeah. in that season So instead of, of the second half being all about you, mm -hmm. like we want it to be all about the kingdom and taking those steps of faith. They're going yeah. for it. Love it. Justin, who, who else? Who's so heroes? the Godly Campus, you know, so we, we really felt uh, God was calling us to Godly you know, for a couple of years now, and we're just trying to follow God's lead on that. But, 
it was it was tough. We couldn't find a, a piece of land we could afford. You know, it was just it was just tough to know where we wanted to be. And so we're just kind of walking through that and just waiting on the Lord, really trying to yeah. wait and uh, follow Him. And uh, all of a sudden, this last year, we get a call from Tony Allen, and he's like, "Guys, I want to help. I want to I want to show you a, a couple pieces of property. I think you're going to be interested in." And sure enough, one of those pieces of property, literally the perfect location for the perfect price. And uh, so now we're starting a godly campus yeah. over there. And so, what's yeah. cool is all the people that have said, hey, I want to be a part of this, yes. and I want to help launch yes. this. And yes. Joe, what's that going to look like? Yeah. yeah, so it's just more steps of faith. Just like you and I moved our yeah. families to Granberry to start, there's going to be people that uh, just ride around the godly area that are going to go and invest their life in that area. Some people may just want to go for three or six months to get it started. And some people may want to say, no, this is my campus. This is my Stonewater campus that I'm going to raise my kids in and pour my life and use my gifts here. Yeah. So we'll be starting the Godly Campus in fall of 2020. And God may be calling you um, to exercise faith and, and to go and be a part of that launch team. Joe, you've been training up some leaders uh, in ministry this past year uh, through Practical Theological Seminary. W what do you see God doing in, in the lives of the students there? Yeah, so really for all of us pastors, so one of the things the Bible says is that we are to equip the saints for the work mm -hmm. of ministry. And that's really what Practical Theological Seminary is all about. It's raising up people within our own church. And there's people outside of our churches that attend as well, but we want to use them for ministry whether they just go right back into the ministry and the church that they're serving at, or we send church planners out or missionaries out or pastors out of this seminary training. It's a two-year program that people really focus on. What is God's call and plan on my life? So our next class starts in January. So uh, go to practicaltheologicalseminary.com and you can sign up. Yeah, so... You know, the, the focus here is, is sending, is reaching, and uh, this next year in 2020, um, we're tackling the biggest expansion project is, in the history is. of our yeah, church, yeah. and the whole goal yeah. is so that we can reach more families for, for Jesus. Now, Justin, as, as we've been tackling this and going for this, uh, what do you see God doing in people's lives? Well, I just see sacrifice. Yeah. You know, I mean, something... Well, we're talking about it being a year of sacrifice. Yeah. So, yeah. so what do you mean by that? So, well, like uh, anything worthwhile, anything big, anything God calls us to is going to require some sacrifice. And and so we're just seeing people do that. Uh, for example, this last year, uh, people have given more than they've ever given before in a year. And so I know when that when, when I see that happen, I know that God is preparing to do something great. And so, yeah, we've got some big projects coming, but uh, God's ready for it. And we've seen people uh, just sacrifice and, and saying yes to God over and over and over. And it's just exciting to watch. You know, there's nothing like... Uh giving that requires yeah. us to truly trust God. That's right. Yeah, and, it's, uh, real, it's the real deal. That's right. Yeah. And, and that's what we've seen yeah. in, in our church family this year. Yeah. You know, church family, uh, as we ran running into Vision 2020 and, and this expansion, uh, we, we've asked uh, the church that said, hey, we, we need to raise $2.1 million. Yeah. And the goal was to raise 500000 by the end of this month. And uh, I, I just want to announce that uh, uh, by today we'll have all the tallies next week, but we've already exceeded our goal of wow. over $500,000. Yeah. So so cool. so church yeah. family, thank you for being a generous church. Thank you for going for it. Uh, you know, uh, another new thing this past year has been uh, some of the new faces that you see around Stonewater and uh, new church members, but also some of the new leaders. And one of the new leaders is uh, Clayton Lowell. You guys know Clayton. Oh, like that guy. Yeah. So, yeah. so Clayton's a young guy that comes in from college, Texas A&M, graduating, and, and, uh, <laughs> but he's leading our students here at the Granbury campus and having influence in every one of the student ministries across the campus. And we thought that uh, you may want to hear his story. Today. Uh, so my parents uh, met in Dallas and I was the oldest of four siblings. So, so I was born in Dallas. I uh, had a brother that was a year younger than me, and at an early age we moved uh, overseas. Uh, we lived in the Philippines for a year and Dubai uh, for another couple of years. So my earliest memories from that time uh, were going to church with my family. Uh, when, we lived, when we lived in Dubai, uh, there wasn't, um, I don't know if church was illegal um, or heavily frowned upon, but. Uh, my parents had to go and meet at a house uh, with blackout curtains and uh, so we went to this house with some other uh, American families and 
uh, did church on, on Sunday morning. Uh, we ended up back uh, in Houston, we moved to the Woodlands when I was uh, early um, junior high, like sixth, seventh grade. Um, I had kind of gotten to an age in uh, seventh grade, uh, you know, you start to think you're uh, a little too cool. You start to kind of gravitate away from your parents and kind of think some of the stuff they do is a little dorky, a little weird. Uh, so that's kind of how I felt about church. I kind of thought it was a, a place where uh, some weird dorky people gathered. I do remember clearly though, this was probably my third time in a, in a student ministry on a Sunday. Uh, and there was a silly game where we could, they had a bunch of caramel apples lined up and they got some volunteers to, to do a caramel apple eating contest. And I was a hefty boy, I like to eat. So uh, I volunteered and I sit behind this caramel apple uh, take a big old bite out of it, and it was an onion that they just had covered in, in caramel. Uh, and I just thought that was the funniest thing. Uh, it just cracked me up. I wanted to impress the lady, so I kept eating the, the caramel-covered onion. But, I mean, that one uh, moment uh, when I was 12, it's just really stuck with me. Um, that kind of changed my um, view of church, and it kind of kept me coming. Um, later on that year, uh, is when I accepted Jesus for the first time. And, uh, I went to Texas A&M uh, to be an engineer. Thought I, engineering was kind of uh, where I wanted to go. And uh, my student pastor growing up reached out to me uh, about halfway through school about a part-time student ministry job that he had in Montgomery, Texas. So uh, I started doing that on the weekends and uh, kept going to school. And then as I was nearing finishing school, I uh, had another full-time student ministry opportunity pop up uh, just through prayer and. Uh, a lot of um, just seeking uh, wisdom from others. Man, I just felt like that it was exactly where I was supposed to go. So I met my wife, Amber, when uh, we were in fifth grade. It was fifth grade PE. Uh, when I first met her, we started dating uh, our sophomore year of high school. Uh, she was the cheer captain. I was on the football team. It was your classic Texas uh, high school story. Uh, yeah, she's been, done nothing but uh, support my dream, and, and that's just to be a, a student pastor. So I. Uh, couldn't ask for a better wife. Right at the end of our first year of marriage, um, Amber got a job opportunity uh, come up in Fort Worth. And uh, both of us were extremely comfortable where we were. Uh, we loved Houston. Uh, both of our families were in Houston. Uh, we just loved our church family. We were just um, at home. Um, but something about this opportunity really um, caught our eye. And uh, we began praying and asking God if, if moving uh, for this job for Amber was of what we were supposed to do. Uh, I remember um, I had seen a posting about the Stonewater job uh, for a couple months and it had been on uh, the top bookmark page in my computer and I never applied, never reached out. I uh, thought I was underqualified or uh, I had never heard of Granberry, so it was just <laughs> a couple things that were just kind of holding me back. Um, shortly thereafter, Amber and I were, were here on a Wednesday night uh, checking out an Elevate. And from, from the start, and that was my first opportunity getting to meet uh, some volunteers and some leaders in the ministry. Uh, first chance to get to meet some of the students in the, in the lead team. And I mean, it was apparent that God uh, for a long time has been working uh, in the students and leaders here. Uh, and honestly, it was something that we just wanted to be a part of. Uh, we had our first um, wake night that I've been a part of where all of our campuses were able to gather here uh, and worship together. So you had students from gosh, 10 different high schools and a bunch of different middle schools, um, but all united uh, under uh, Jesus, all worshiping the same God. Uh, man, I, I can't wait to see uh, what God has in store for, for this group. So I'm excited to be a part of it. I'm expecting God to do big things uh, for Stonewater in 2020.
Hey Stillwater family, welcome to our house. I have something I want to show you. Come on. This is our chicken coop. Me and the kids built this a few years ago. And uh, this is where Misty keeps her chickens. She loves these chickens. Y'all think I can catch one? Have you ever wanted to do something or, uh, whew, I'm out of breath, or felt called by God to do something, but you were just too chicken? <laughs> you know, a funny thing about chickens is this, is that when they get scared, they often just drop to the ground and stop. We've got a weenie dog and our little wiener dog gets, uh, I guess she loves the taste of chicken because she's often chasing the chickens all around. And sometimes the chickens just get scared and they drop to the ground paralyzed in fear. You know, that's what fear does. Fear paralyzes us. Fear stops us in our tracks. Fear keeps us from going for the life that God has for us. You know, faith does the opposite. Faith propels. Faith causes us to, to go where God is moving. Faith uh, really fuels us to go for it. As we get into 2020, and as we go for the life that God has called us to, one of the things that's gonna be required is this, is that we have faith. And you may be asking, well, how do I get faith? How do I get more faith? Well, the answer is God. We have to learn to depend upon God. You know the Christian life, it can be simplified to this, daily, dependence upon Jesus. God really is a God that can be trusted. Jesus can be trusted. You know, as a child, my, my parents encouraged me and my brother and my sister to memorize the 23rd Psalm. Psalm 23 is a passage that really reinforces the fact that we can trust and have faith in God, that God's a good shepherd that God protects us, that God provides for us, that God looks out for us, that God guides us all the way through life. Let, let's just read it, Psalm 23. I'm gonna be reading from the ESV version. I encourage you at home uh, to grab your Bible and, and follow along with me. Psalm 23 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Let's stop right there. God is our shepherd and he's a really good shepherd. And, and it says that we shall not want. That, that word want means this, that we shouldn't lack anything. That, that God is here to provide for, for every need that we have. He's, he's a good shepherd. We can trust him. Let's look at verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. This verse reminds us that God is the one that leads us or brings us to a place of rest, a place of peace, a place of refreshments. That, that sounds like a God that can be trusted. Verse 3 says this, He restores my soul. My soul. What's your soul? Our, our soul is our mind, our, our emotions, our will. And, and this says that God restores our, our soul, our mind, emotions, our will. If you think about it, the enemy does the opposite. The enemy corrupts our mind, our emotions, and our will. He makes us think things, lies that, that mess, mess with our mind causes us to feel things in our emotions that, that just aren't the truth of what God desires for us to feel. And, and our will, that's our want to. The enemy often takes away our want to. Well, God, he does the opposite. He restores. Where the enemy corrupts, God restores. He's a good shepherd. He restores our soul. Let's keep reading. He leads us. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his sake. In other words, God will lead us down the right road for life, and it's all about His glory and all about His fame. In, in verse 4, it says this, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no, uh, no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know, in life, we're, we're going to go through difficult times. We're going to go through times that are really scary for us. But the promise here in this, this verse, in verse 4, is this, is that God's always going to be with us. 
and that he's there to comfort us. I, I picture God walking with us or Jesus walking with us with a walking stick. And it's just that picture that, that he's always with us no matter where we walk in life. Verse 5 says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup over, overflows. The, the picture here in verse 5 is this. It's cool assurance under pressure. That, that when the pressures of life heat up, that God's there and He's, he's got us. He's right there with us. The passage ends at verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The, the promise is this, is that goodness and mercy will be marked in our life by uh, as we as we walk through our life and as we journey through our life and experience life goodness and mercy they're going to follow and then the promise is is that we'll dwell in the house of the lord forever in other words we'll spend an eternity with him in his house that's that shows a closeness or an intimacy that will be with the lord forever now that's a god that can be trusted the Christian life, the Christian walk, is a walk of daily dependence upon Jesus. You know, if you think about spiritual maturity and, and growing in faith, it's, it's kind of the opposite of physical maturity. You know, at, uh, w- when we're all born, uh, we're, we come out as, as babies that are completely dependent upon our mom and our dad. Mom and dads feed us and our parents take care of us. They nourish us. We need them for everything. But then as we grow, we become teenagers. Uh, I've got teenagers. And, and as teenagers, we become more independent. We, we don't need mom and dad as, as much. And, and we can uh, do things on our own. And then that's what adulthood looks like. Adulthood looks like total independence. Like we, we can uh, basically take care of ourselves. <laughs> and, then, and then we die. And such is life. That's, that's kind of the, the physical life cycle. But, but how about spiritually? What happens to us spiritually? Well, we're spiritually, the way that we grow is this. We come into a relationship with Jesus, birth through death. That's right. We're, we're born spiritually by dying to ourselves. Galatians 2.20 says, For I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. See, growing in spiritual maturity looks like this. It it, it looks like that that we go from independence to dependence. See, when we start walking with Christ, we we learn to to stop trusting in ourselves, independence, and trust more and more and more in Him. Spiritual maturity is total dependence upon Jesus. It's walking with Jesus daily. I love living here on this ranch. You know, this ranch has been in our family since 1856, and it's just passed down from one generation to the next. Living out here has has taught me a lot about God. See, it's my responsibility to take care of the land. It's my responsibility to to take care of the animals. And in doing so, God has taught me this, that that I'm very much like a cow. (laughs) That's right. Uh, My cows depend upon me. And just like my cows depend upon me, I have to depend upon God. It's my responsibility to, to feed my cows. And, uh, and, and all my cows have to do is eat. You know, that's true with God as well. God is our provider. It's, it's His responsibility and He, he cares for, for us well uh, to, to feed us and to nourish us. And, and our responsibility is just to eat and to enjoy what God brings us. I love to look after my cows. And I love to make sure that they're well fed. In the winter, I feed the hay to my cows almost every single day. I haul it, I uh, take it out to them, I cut the twine. Uh, part of my, my favorite part of the uh, feeding hay is actually uh, unrolling the hay for the cows with a farm truck. And, and just as my cows depend upon me to feed, you know, I've got to depend upon God for not my nourishment. That's what it looks like to depend upon God. The thing I love about God is that God really knows us. <laughs> I, I know my cows, and, and they know me. Number four, well, she's the oldest. Number seven, she was given to me by my grandfather. That red one over there, number 13, that's Hudson's. And she's actually a sister to number seven. 
Number 49, well, that's Roxy. I call her Foxy Roxy. And 80, well, he's my bull. We call him Bull Rito. And his other bull buddy, his name's Howie. My cows, uh, many of them have names, and I know their names because I'm the one that named them. Um, my cows, though, they, uh, they know my voice. I can be a mile away and call them, and they come. You know, the very same is true with God. God knows every one of us. He knows us by name. He knows our quirks. He knows what makes us special. He knows what makes us unique. And He loves us just as we are. And our job is very similar to my cows. It's when God calls us, we hear His voice, is that we come to Him and we obey Him. And we allow Him to provide for us. God can be trusted. God, we can depend upon Him. Another thing about my cows is this is that it's my responsibility to protect my cows. Uh, God's our protector. You know, uh, I've got fences around all of my pastures and, and the fences, they keep my cows in a safe place. They're not out on the road, run over by a truck or by a car. Uh, I'm protecting them with that fence. I vaccinate them from time to time and vaccination, it, it protects them from disease. And every once in a while I have to get my gun out and run off a predator that's endangering my cattle, but, but I protect my cattle. God is the same way. God is our protector. And, and oftentimes we, we, we may feel that uh, or, or not understand why He has us in a certain place, but, but that's because He's protecting us. He has us there, uh, watching over us, protecting us. He's the one that protects us against the enemy. See, God really does care for us. We can trust Him. We can depend upon Him. So I want to challenge you in 2020 to learn to depend upon God. The Christian walk is daily dependence upon God. You know, as we look into 2020, I don't know what God is going to call you and your family to, but I do know this, it's going to require faith. So let's let 2020 be a year that God grows us all in our faith. In 2020, let's go for it. Let's go for it. Let's go for it! 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 Let